So in part one and two, we talked about how our author likes to write about hive-minded races and telepathic suggestion. And I put forward the idea that all prophecy is fake, but suggestion is real. After all, if I tell everyone that you're going to the grocery store, and then I convince you to go to the grocery store, am I really a seer? If the three-eyed crow tells Jojen that the Ironborn are coming to Winterfell, and then he convinces the Ironborn to come to Winterfell, is he really a seer? When one examines these prophecies closely, one finds that they're often wrong or inaccurate. For example, Jojen saw that Septon Shale, Micken, and Alebelly would drown, except in the end, only Shale actually drowns. Now one could argue at least the dream identified who would die at the hands of Ironborn, except that wouldn't be correct either, as Farlan the Kennelmaster is also killed by Theon. Now one can always make the argument that under some certain metaphorical interpretation that everything did come true, but that's the problem. Metaphorical prophecy is not falsifiable, which is kind of the whole point. Bran and Jojen want these prophecies to be true, and therefore they're going to twist reality into making them true. Micken didn't drown, yet Bran is convinced that he did. Now there's only one other dream by either Bran or Jojen that's at all impressive. For the rest of A Storm of Swords and A Dance with Dragons, Bran only has wolf dreams and general dreams about the Three-Eyed Crow. This means that we don't know of any dreams that Bran has had that have predicted the future. Jojen's green dreams also drop off. In A Storm of Swords, he only has two dreams. He has a very general dream about how the wolves will return, and he has a dream about the wall. He's convinced that there's passage through the night fort, which means, again, he's given information from far away, but nothing of the future. Once passing through the wall, Jojen has no new dreams. But Jojen has one last impressive dream in A Clash of Kings that we need to talk about, and that's his dream about Reek. Reek is, of course, actually Ramsay, and Jojen's dream has Ramsay skinning the faces off Bran and Rickon. Now this dream is incorrect, Bran and Rickon never die, but it's also correct in a way. Ramsay skins the Miller's boys, whose bodies are used as Bran and Rickon's. It's a pretty darn good guess of the future. After all, how could Jojen possibly know that Ramsay would be captured in disguise, brought to Winterfell, put into Theon's service, and then convince Theon to cut off those boys' faces? Green dreams must be prophetic, right? But something just doesn't sit right. Jojen seems to know the future, but so does Ramsay. What am I talking about? Ramsay, by all accounts, is incredibly intelligent and calculating. Yet after taking Hornwood and torturing Lady Hornwood, Ramsay is brazenly hunting a girl in the woods. And while hunting, he's captured by Sir Roderick. No guards, no soldiers were around Ramsay, despite the fact that Manderley Knights and Dreadfort men were in open war in the same woods. Now this is quite odd, as Ramsay usually hunts with a posse of men and hounds. And Ramsay must have known that taking Hornwood would lead to northern retaliation. He must have known that Winterfell men were coming very soon. Why on earth would Ramsay be hunting at this moment? And why on earth would he be hunting alone save for Reek? Being caught out in the woods so carelessly seems very un ramsay like And a closer look at Ramsay's story reveals some fishy contradictions. Ramsay claims that the real Reek's horse was lamed. Okay, if that's true, how did they catch up to the hunted girl at all? Later, Ramsay tells Reek to take his horse because it's faster. Faster? I thought the issue was that Reek's horse was lamed. Now, it's somewhat believable that Ramsay could quickly dirty himself up to become Reek. But how could Reek clean himself up so quickly to become Ramsay? Reek stinks. How did he take a bath in that woods? Or did Reek actually take a bath before they left? And Ramsay gives Reek some remarkably fine clothing. Calfskin boots? A velvet doublet? A family ring that's never mentioned again? Are these clothes really appropriate for a hunt and a raping? Keep in mind that even King Robert wore regular leather boots and a regular doublet when hunting. Fine doublets often display heraldry. Isn't it awfully convenient that Ramsay had so many items on hand that could be used to identify him? It's almost as if Ramsay planned to be captured. But how can that be? Rotting in a Winterfell dungeon is nothing to be desired. In fact, it's a stroke of astounding, astounding luck for Ramsay that Theon captured Winterfell to release him. That is, unless Ramsay, like Jojen, knew Theon was coming. Could Ramsay have gotten the same dream of water at Winterfell that Jojen did? Did Theon get that dream too? Is that why all three of them came to Winterfell? After all, multiple people receiving the same dream is a fairly common occurrence in Westeros. Bran and Rickon received the same dream about Ned dying. The Warlocks and the Crones of Vase Doth Rock both received visions about the stallion that mounts the world. And the Warlocks and the Ghost of High Heart both received visions about the Red Wedding. And this isn't the only time that Ramsay correctly predicts the future. 
In fact, it's not even the only time he has the same information as Jojen. Let's talk about Bran's escape from Winterfell. After Bran and company go missing, Theon gets a posse together to track Bran. The dogs have Bran sent, but eventually lose Bran because he's doubled back to Winterfell to hide in the crypts. This causes Theon to kill the Miller's boys in Bran and Rickon's place. But here's what's amazing. Ramsay already has Bran's clothing and a flaying knife with him. Somehow Ramsay knew Theon would fail to find Bran. How? Before leaving, it seemed quite probable that the crew would find Bran and Rickon. Bran and Rickon were afoot after all. And yet Ramsay is already prepared to skin the Miller's boys. In our entire story, Jojen really only has two impressive predictions. The first, that Theon is coming to Winterfell, and the second, that the Miller's boys will be flayed. And by coincidence, Ramsay has made those same predictions. Something is going on with Theon, Jojen, and Ramsay's heads. Is it prophecy, or is it suggestion? Or are they one and the same? If you received a vision of you going to the grocery store, would you go to the grocery store, or would you avoid the grocery store? Ramsay very well could be like Jojen. He could be trying to fulfill visions for the old gods. After all, the Boltons follow the old gods as well. Ramsay may have felt that it was his destiny to come to Winterfell to stop the Ironborn, and then to flay the Miller's boys. And his actions play right into the Three-Eyed Crow's hand. Bran's home is destroyed, and he's driven north. And because everyone thinks he's dead, no one is going looking for him. So let's switch gears for a moment. With all of this talk of telepathically sent dreams, one has to ask, is A Song of Ice and Fire science fiction? I would say there is a strong indication that it is. You see, our author has written several times about something he calls an interregnum. As defined by our author, an interregnum is a dark age of sorts. It's a period of time where a civilization loses space travel and has yet to gain it again. And this regression in technology is usually caused by a devastating event like a war. In George R.R. Martin's Thousand World Universe, humanity experiences an interregnum after their war with the Harangans. And our author even has several stories about societies that have fallen back to medieval levels of technology. For example, both Bitter Blooms and In the House of the Worm take place on such worlds. So, has Westeros experienced a devastating war? Well, it certainly experienced the Long Night. The Long Night was a winter without daylight that lasted a generation. A pretty extreme sounding experience. But let's step back from magic and fantasy for a moment. You know, a winter can last a generation without daylight. It isn't really fantasy. It can most certainly happen in the real world. It's called a nuclear winter. The soot from nuclear explosions enter the atmosphere and block out sunlight, causing global cooling. And the effects can last for years or decades depending on the amount of explosions. Now you may be thinking, a nuclear war? How did everyone survive? Well, nuclear bunkers, of course. And Westeros seems to have those in spades. There are the caves of the children of the forest. There are the tunnels beyond the wall that Gorn used. There are the deep tunnels underneath the Night Fort. There are the tunnels of Moletown. There are the crypts beneath Winterfell. Casterly Rock is built into a mountain. There are the tunnels beneath Dragonstone. There are the tunnels beneath the Whispers. There are the caverns beneath the Eyrie. There are the caves of the Riverlands and the hollows of Cracklaw Point. And there are the mines of Castamere and of the Westerlings and of the Good Brothers, and of the Valerians, and of the Pentashi. This certainly wouldn't be the first time that our author wrote about societies that went underground after a disaster. For example, in Dark Dark Were the Tunnels, humans from the moon arrive on Earth to find a new telepathic mutated society beneath the ground. And in the House of the Worm, society enters the Earth and splits into two, with half near the surface and half mutated in the deeper tunnels. But let's go back to the Thousand Worlds and talk about the human Harangan War. As I mentioned before, there are large thematic similarities between the Children of the Forest and the Harangans. This is the history of a planet called High Cavalon and its interregnum after its conflict with the Harangans. The Harangans level cities with nuclear bombardment. Survivors live only in the deep shelters and out in the wild, in the mines. To make the planet their own, the Harangans also land contingents of their slave races. Then they depart not to return for a century. The mines are the first holdfasts. Others are built later, carved deep into stone. Their cities gone, the miners revert to a more primitive level of technology and soon establish a rigid, survival-oriented culture. For endless generations, they war against the slave races and against each other. At the same time, beneath the radioactive ruins of the cities, human mutations begin to arise. What kind of mutations? 
Well, in Dark Dark Were the Tunnels, humanity gains telepathy. And in Dying of the Light, humanity gains the ability to shape change. This causes a rival holdfast to want to skin the shape changers, much in the same way Boltons would skin Starks. So is this happening in our story? Let's call this theory the Harangan Hypothesis. An alien race nuked Planetos. Human society survived by living beneath the Earth, while the Earth descended into a nuclear winter. Alien slave races arrived to battle humanity as well, while human society regressed to a more primitive level of technology. Small gene pools and radiation cause rapid mutations. Some human beings gained telepathy to help them scavenge, while other human beings gained a resistance to cold. These mutations led to bitter rivalries and war between holdfasts. Now I will say that stories about breeding with the children of the forest and the giants kind of goes against the idea that they're aliens. However, every other aspect of the High Cavalon history seems to fit Westeros pretty well. But there are other possibilities out there on what caused the apocalypse, and what caused the monsters of Westeros to appear. And so next time we'll talk about the others, genetics, and what I call the Theta Hypothesis. We'll see you in part four.